All right, Jaquan here from the Foundation with the great uh, pianist and jazz legend Lonnie Lister Smith. It's an honor to talk to you. All right, Jay. All right, and my first question for you is: You, uh, where were you born and raised, and what was your first um, entry into music, or what made you first interested in music? Oh, well, Jay, um, I was born in Richmond, Virginia, and coming from a, a musical family, and. Uh, my father was a member of the Harmonizing Four gospel group, and they were big all over the world. And uh, so we had a piano in the house, and whoever showed interest in the piano, then my father let us start taking lessons. I have two younger brothers, and they they talented also. And so uh, that that's how I started, you know, with the piano. Okay, and did you play other instruments as well, or you just attach more to the piano, or? Yeah, um, when I when I got to um, went to start going to school. Okay. So I wanted to be in the marching band. I wanted to sing in the choir. So I had to sing bass in the choir because I don't have that beautiful voice like my two younger brothers Ray and Donald. Okay. And my father got that beautiful tenor voice. So but in the marching band, the only thing they had was uh, they said no, everybody wanted to play saxophone and trumpet. They said I need the band leaders. I need tuba players. I said, I don't care. I want to be in the band. So I played tuba all the way from middle school, high school, all the way through to college. So that was great. Okay, okay. Now you spoke about your brothers. Um, tell me a little bit about your, your brothers and their musical, uh, their entries into the music world. Oh, yes. Well, of course, everyone knows about my younger brother, Donald Smith. Okay. Because he's singing on expansions and visions of a new world, all the first albums. Okay. And he, he sings, plays piano, and plays flute. But the middle brother, people don't realize, uh, is Ray Smith. Okay. He had a hit record, you know, the John Mill, the Little Bit of Soap. Okay. That's, that's Ray Smith. And, uh, wow. They had a hit record way before I got to New York. Okay. And, and you know, he learned about the music business the hard way. The, uh, they had his hit record and wasn't making money, so he said, y'all got this. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Understood. Understand. Okay, so which what great pianists were there that made you kind of want to go into the jazz genre? Tell me about some of your uh, people you kind of modeled yourself after or were impressed with coming up. Oh yeah, well what happened was my father, man. He 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 was really into music. Okay, I mean he liked gospel, anything. So we listened to everything. So so we listened to people like uh, Art Tatum on piano, uh, Earl Gardner. Um, Fast Waller. Uh, okay. I mean, these these guys were Oscar Peterson. Oh man, these guys were fantastic. Okay. And then, uh, you know, people don't realize Nat King Cole was was a a great jazz pianist before he started singing. He just happened to sing one night. Okay. And the rest is history. And then there was another young man named Finest Newborn Junior. Oh man, oh, these. Wow. I mean, these guys really played the whole eighty eight keys. Okay. Okay. And that influenced you to, to want to go the jazz route. Oh, oh yeah, because then, well, when, when I, I heard Charlie Parker, and uh, it was Charlie Parker with strings. Ah, okay. And man, I said, what is he doing? They said, man, he's doing improvisation. I said, oh, that's what I want to do, creative improvisation like that. Mm -hmm. He sounded so beautiful. He was just flying all over the world. I mean, you know, on his horn. I said, mm -hmm. that's great. Okay. Okay. Now you being a Richmonder, and I'm a Richmonder myself, okay. and I know how hard it is um, uh, with no real infrastructure, no real music business here. Um, how did? What was your first big break um, coming from Richmond? How did you get your first break into the industry? Well, <clears throat> in Richmond, we uh, in high school we had a band called the uh, Metronome All Stars. Okay. So we I just started playing around town, and um, but then I heard a lot of uh, musicians they used to come through. Back then, they used to come to, to the Mars. I think they called it the Landmark Theater now. Yes. I called the Jazz of Philharmonics. I called all these great jazz artists. And then I called Second Street was um, was doing real good then. The Hippodrome Theater mm -hmm. and Eggleston, all those places were definitely just as big as New York. And I think I mean, we, we mentioned before that uh, that's how I got to know uh, Billy Eckstein. Yes. And... Uh, I was on tour and we were doing the jazz show. So I was on the show with Billy Eckstein and Sarah Vaughn and I was just playing straight ahead jazz. Yes. 
And I said, now, how am I going to get a chance to hang out with Billy Eckstein? I didn't want to, you know, bother him. So he heard me talking to his uh, musical director in the hall. I said, man, I'm from Richmond, Virginia. Oh, Jay, he ran out <laughs> Tooth Street. I said, oh, okay. Uh, <laughs> man, they love Second Street, but they call it Tooth Street. Yes. They used to play the Hippodrome and stay at the Eggerson Hotel mm -hmm. and restaurant. Yes. I mean, they loved it. Yeah. So I had a chance to hang out with him for the whole tour. Yeah, Two Street really was a big deal. I want to say that on James, the James Brown movie that came out a couple of years ago, they mentioned uh, Second Street because uh, I know James Brown, you know, he really was uh, was big in, in the area when he came here. Oh, so he that, was big on Two Street. That, that's good, Jacob. People don't realize that at that time, it was just as big as, you know, up there in New York as Apollo. Yes. Hmm. Now, one thing I noticed on, on all your albums, uh, you know, from Astral Traveling to uh, you know, Cosmic Funk, um, even expansions with the animated cover, you always had like a, like a, a head wrap, like a kufi, like the Muslims call it a kufi, and you always mm -hmm. had uh, spiritual symbols on your on your records. Um, and I know this was the time, you know, black power movement was still going on. You know, Martin Luther King got assassinated. You know, Malcolm X got assassinated. Set the tone for me because I wasn't born yet. Of of what um, where you were coming from with the imagery because you had a lot of spiritual and uh, uh, you know just a different kind of imagery for black people at the time. Well, Jay, what happened was you know I came came out of the church you know because yes. my father was gospel music. Yes. And I wish the young kids would realize today that uh, back then all, all the great artists came out of the church. Rita yes, Franklin, mm -hmm. even John Coltrane, everybody. Yes. Uh, so what what I wanted to do was ex expand on that spiritually in a universal way. Okay. Uh, so I started studying all kinds of different uh, religions and philosophies. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And and I had all these, uh, on my on, on the head I had all these rhinestones. Yes. Well, I guess they would say bling now, but, yes, yeah. <laughs> but, but people don't realize sound and color and it all go together. Yes. If you're really in tune, you can... When you hear sound, you can see colors or vice versa. Okay. I mean, but you really got to be in tune. Yes. So I had all these rhinestones on the hat and on, on the clothes. I even had a cover on the um, Pinner Rose piano with mm -hmm. rhinestones on it. Oh, wow. So I'd be playing, and when the light hit it, the colors would bounce back. Uh -huh. okay. And I said, oh, that, that's what I wanted. So I had sound and color. Okay. And then... You study all these different religions and different things, philosophies, and everybody is saying the same thing. Peace. Everybody wants peace. Everybody wants love, mm -hmm. happiness, yeah. harmony, world peace. And you said, uh, so what's the problem? Well, why Why we all can't get along? We're fighting. Right. So that's what I, when I wrote Expansions, mm -hmm. you know, expand your mind. So yes. we have a, a vision. The next thing was a vision of a new world. Yes. And then I wrote Give Peace a Chance. Mm -hmm. And actually, this morning, I was thinking before you got here that um, now I've been writing songs about world peace for over 45 years. Yes. Now, I have not heard from the Nobel Peace Prize people yet. <laughs> I, mean, I don't understand that. Yes. I... Because music is the only universal language on this planet Earth. Correct. So maybe they don't recognize that. So Good I had point. to put that in. Excellent point. <laughs> Definitely. And I think you were telling me before, somewhere around the late 90s, you became a Hebrew Israelite. Is that correct? Oh, uh, yeah. What happened was, I was in Germany, and I met this guy named, uh, his, his Hebrew name was Yosef. Okay. And But his stage name was Eddie Bo. He's okay. from New Orleans, and he sings and plays piano. And perv he was famous. Okay. And he used to tell me, he said, man, you know, God's name is Yahweh, and you know, you're a Hebrew Israelite. I said, yeah, Okay. So then we started studying in his room, and, uh, and I went to the feast of, uh, I think it was Passover. Okay. But, but I guess in Hebrew they call it Pesach. Yes. And so uh, I said, ah, oh, this is what I've been looking for all, all along. So, so now, you know, my Hebrew name is Yehuda. Okay. And so, you know, when, when, when I mentioned God, I said Yahweh. Somebody else might say Jehovah or... Right. I don't know Hashem, but uh, same creator though. Right, that's that's the thing. Jay, that's the good thing because people, it's it's only one creator. That's right. But we are going to fight over the name. Exactly right. So <laughs> right. So I, you know, You're exactly right. That's You're exactly it. right. So now, 
this was your first time ever being exposed to this uh, particular um, religion, the Hebrew Israelites? You, right. Okay. That, that, that's amazing because I was in New York. Right, right. And, man, I, I went to, I would go, in New York, they got everything. Yes. I go to the Rosicrucian classes. Yes. Transcendental meditation classes. Yes, yes. I even went through the thing. What's that thing? Herbie's into. Now I'm going to ring and kill. Yes, yes. Oh, yes. We, I mean, I was going right. to all the yes. meetings and mm -hmm. the Theosophical Society. Uh huh. So I was doing my uh, research and mm -hmm. I wrote a song in search of truth. Yes, yes. But when I heard about Hebrew Israelite and, and God's name is Yahweh, you know, some just like the music, something just lights up inside. Yes, yes, it clicks. I said, well, right. this, this is it. This is what I've been looking for. Okay. Now, I know that you, you played with Miles Davis, and um, I've interviewed a lot of musicians who played with Miles, and one recurring theme that they always talk about, mm -hmm. all of them say <clears throat> that Miles used space or silence as an instrument. Um, what's your thoughts on that, playing with Miles? Did he, can you confirm that he did that? And what's the importance of using silence or space as, a, as an instrument itself? Oh, that's, that's it, uh, Jay, because Miles, I, I, I heard the same thing from Miles, and had a... When I was working with our Blake, I had a chance to hang out with Monk. Yes. And they both said the same thing, that um, musicians don't realize what you don't play can be more important than what you do play. Uh -huh. And because it's, it's, it's the space. Mm -hmm. And just like a person talking, if you just go and talk forever, that's crazy. Or like in, in the theater or like in um, comedian, the timing. Mm -hmm. And so all, all that... Oh, that's important. Yeah. And like I tell young musician, you know, especially for the piano, because um, the horn players and the vocalists, people relate to them right away because it's coming from here, right? Yeah. I at, I, but the piano, you be doing your fingers. So I tell piano, the young piano, say you got to learn how to breathe through your fingers. And they, right, you know, right. they might not understand that. Good point. But Good point. That's it. You you got to do it just like someone is singing. Yes. And. Um, so space is is very important. Okay. And speaking of Miles, how did you how did you even get the gig to play with you know somebody as, as great and prolific as Miles Davis? How did you get that gig? Oh, you you, you get a call because you know mm -hmm. Miles Miles. I don't know how he he, he almost knows everything. Or he <laughs> he knows when you, when people get in town. because ah. he you know uh, Tony Williams he found him when he was what mm. 15, 16. Yes. yes. Uh, so you need. You start your name started getting around. I started yeah. with a Rosson Roland Kirk. Yes. Then I started working with Max Roach. Then I started working with Art Blakely. Wow. And it just keeps getting around. Then mm -hmm. I think Miles called me to do a. Oh, that was funny. He called me to do a. a they said, "Man, Miles doing this record day. Want you to?" I said, "Okay." And uh, I walk in a record day. That's three keyboards. I said, "Oh shoot! Now what is this?" That was Herbie and another guy. And I thought I was supposed to, we were all going to, you know, take our turn. Yes. So I stood up against the wall. So Miles, said, you know, he's very candid. <laughs> he mm -hmm. said, yes. But the bleep, you know, you're waiting for. Right. And, uh, <laughs> so we all had to play together. But mm -hmm. so you got to stay out of each other's way and, mm -hmm. and make sense out of it. And then I, then I started going, going on tour with him. And, you know, he was, that was the thing about him. He wanted you to create. He'd get mad if you didn't create. Mm. Okay. And that's, that's you know, very few people want that. But he wants you to create every night and uh, want you to be spontaneous. Mm -hmm. Oh, now another funny story. Sure. So we get to the rehearsal, my first rehearsal at his house. Uh, so I'm ready now. Like I said, the Thunder Rose. I'm going to jump on the Thunder Rose piano. I'm gonna, I, get to, I get to Miles' house. I don't see the Thunder Rose. I said, Miles, what am I playing? In the corner, he had an electric organ, mm -hmm. and because he didn't want no Fender Rose anymore. Right. I mean, you got you don't had Herbie, you don't had Chick Corea, you don't had Joe Zavano. He said, "Man, I want a different sound." The Japanese gave him this 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 Yamaha electric organ, uh, you know, made just like a regular keyboard. Yeah. He said, "I said, well, I said, Miles, uh, I never played it." He said, "Good." That's wonderful. I said, <laughs> that means I got to really get into it on stage. Yes. I said, Miles, can I take it home? Nope. I said, why? <laughs> he wanted you to, right. to be spontaneous. Yes. And, I, and I had to learn this thing. and But it worked. I mean, it is, it's, it's amazing. Do you think that technique worked? Do you think that made you better than if you had a chance to take it home and actually sit down with it and practice? you think him putting you in a spot like that or making you do it right there made it better? 
That's it, Jay. It, it did. It, it had to make you better. I yes. mean, because you wanted, yes. <laughs> you wanted to stay there yes. and keep the job. Mm -hmm. And um, so it did. I mean, I mean, you had to really get better. And uh, that was, a, and that's the thing about Miles, because everybody that left Miles' group formed their own group. Yes. He made you stronger. Mm -hmm. So, because if you couldn't deal with the um, his honesty and truthfulness. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you just fall by the wayside. But if you could do it, you, you became stronger and you became a leader. Have you seen uh, the movie that came out? I think last year with Don, that Don Cheadle did. Mm -hmm. um, you know, you being a personal friend and associate of Miles, was it pretty accurate uh, as far as how he was? Was he really that um, candid? Is with his attitude really like what, oh. what Cheadle portrayed? Oh yeah, no, he's definitely definitely candid. Okay. I think Don, like Don said, though, he had that. Kind of embellish or exaggerate mm -hmm. certain exactly. scenes, right? Because they wouldn't give him the money, right, to okay. make the movie. So, mm. but I, but Miles was that candid and that honest. Uh, all, that was it all the time, twenty four seven. Okay. And so he, uh, and you know, he, he was he was a Gemini, so that means uh, he, <laughs> so he had that split personality. Duality, you yes. never knew yes, which sir. one yes, was going to show up, yes, but. Sir. Uh, let me, oh, another good example, he called me when, because, um, you know, I, I discovered Marcus Miller when he was about 16 years old, okay. you know, the bass player? Yes. I um, mean, he's phenomenal. Mm -hmm. And so, Miles was getting ready to hire Marcus, and he called me and uh, said, man, what do you think of Marcus? I said, so I got on the test, oh, man, Miles, you, 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 you've met your twin. <laughs> he said, oh, there you go, that cosmic stuff again, he hung the phone up. <laughs> and... <laughs> then, then he calls back. Uh, I said, Miles, he's a Gemini like you, and mm -hmm. and look what happened. He produced a big hit for Miles, yes. Tutu, I think. Yes. And uh, wow, that was it worked. Wow. Okay, now me being a record collector, I've been a record collector for you know most of my most of my uh, life, definitely my whole adult life. Mm -hmm. um, and I've come across some records by another uh, another Lonnie Smith. So what, what's what's the deal with this other Lonnie Smith uh, in the jazz genre? Oh man, that's that's I can't understand that, but I guess <laughs> that that's another test. Yes. But it, but it's his name is Lonnie Smith. Okay. And he plays organ. And he was with George Benson way before George Benson became famous. Okay. I think George had a trio, organ and drums, in himself. Mm -hmm. And so. Um, Cause I remember we was discussing it. I said, Lonnie Smith, oh, this is this is this is too much here. So that's when I had to start using my whole name. Yes. Cause my middle name is Liston. So yes. I said, Lonnie Liston Smith, to get that separation. And mm -hmm. um, cause you know he has this bit now he has this beard and the turban and the, yes. and the stick and I said, right. oh, and it, it gets confusing because a lot yes. of people will go hear him and and. Um, they said, oh, man, they said, I thought that was you, Lonnie. Right, and then right. um, uh, I got a call from BMI, you know, the music publishing company. Yeah, publishing people. company, yes. Uh, but in April, and they said, well, one of the executives sent me an email, really. And he said, uh, Lonnie, well, well, some of the executives, we're coming down to D.C. to hear you play. I said, uh-oh. So then I had to get on the phone and call the executives. I said, no, that's not me. That's, oh. that's Dr. Lonnie Smith. Right, right. And so they said, oh. And so it, it's, it's really it's caused a lot of confusion, but um, I have to just deal with it. You maybe need to make sure that uh, ASCAP or BMI is sending some of his uh, some of your royalty checks to him. Oh, <laughs> I, I, I've, never, well, I've been there since the late 60s. So I hope not. <laughs> exactly, exactly. <laughs> All right, so I want to get to the, uh, the hip-hop, um, mm -hmm. you know, the, the rap thing. And not not the sample part yet, but um, late 70s, 79, mm -hmm. when the first rap records uh, started coming out. I know that a lot of uh, people from the previous generation didn't necessarily appreciate rap. I know Don Cornelius didn't like it too much. And ah. even my parents and grandparents didn't didn't love some of the first records. Um, being a musician at that time, how did you feel about rap music back in the late 70s, early 80s when you first heard it? Well, Jay, it, it, it really didn't bother me because... When Farrell Saunders and I, you know, were together, um, we used to do shows with the last ports. Oh. 
So, I mean, man, they, they were really serious. Yeah, they were heavy, definitely. They, and so, so I, I was used to, you know, I guess, that form of rap or speaking and, or mm -hmm. poetry. Yeah. And so, um, so when, when I heard the, you know, the, we, we know, I guess what they call it, the hip hop and things like that. Mm -hmm. So, you know, I, I, I got an idea because I can imagine where they, they're probably familiar with the last poets sure. and other groups before sure. them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, so it, it didn't bother me because I did a thing with uh, Donna Bird and I did a, a record with uh, Guru mm -hmm. and um, we did the very first one. I forget what they called it. Jazz Matage. Jazz Matage. Yes. yes. And uh, man, this, they had us on MTV. They went crazy. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they don't put jazz on MTV. Right. But they said, oh man, this is history. Jazz meets rap or rap meets jazz. Mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. So it was amazing how big it got. Yeah, I, I remember that MTV episode, and it was always that marriage. You know, MTV they you know they called onto it late, but it's always that marriage with uh, rap and jazz. I remember the uh, Pieces of a Dream had a song called oh. Beyond Every Groove when they were produced by um, Grover Washington Jr. Okay. and they were doing some rap in the early '80s. Um, so they definitely always had that. So for Guru, um, how did Guru reach out to you? Did he do it through the record company? Is that yeah. he just went through the company and y'all did it that way? Yeah, because what happened. I was I wasn't doing anything out because I was down here. Right. So, because on each cut was a different person. Yes. And uh, so they said, "Well, we 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 doing this thing. We want to use a, a different jazz artist on each cut." Mm -hmm. And they said, "And they said, okay, we'll pay you this amount of money and mm -hmm. give you a little bit of this toward off of the uh, the song. Mm -hmm. and we'll fly you to New York." Mm -hmm. So I said, okay. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I just, just did it out of curiosity. Right. And and the thing blew up. It worked. Did you like that? Did you genuinely like the outcome? Did you like the song? Oh, you know? oh yeah. I mean, this hit, I forget, down the back street. Mm -hmm. I mean, I can't, I don't know. Yeah. All I know was in G minor. Mm -hmm. But, um, I and it was amazing. It worked. I remember that. I like that. Yeah. Cool. And so did you actually... So you actually recorded with Guru. You didn't. You didn't piece it together. You were in the studio with him. Oh no, we were. We were. We were in the studio. Mm -hmm. I've never yeah. done that other way. I know people, mm -hmm. like now. The email stuff back and oh, forth. Oh yeah, I've, <laughs> I've never done that. But you know, I give up. Maybe one day I learn. But. Right. <laughs> it's probably a little more organic and better to do it. Now, that's bounce, the word. Bounce the energy off of each other. I like that word because I always want everything to be organic. Yes. That's it. Yes. Okay. All right. So. You know, and continuing in the vein of the whole hip hop thing, the technology became available where um, we could sample your whole thing. You know, the thing with rap is the beginnings of it. We just, as we talked before, rappers just want to beat, basically. So, you know, the guy like Bob James who puts out Take Me to Mardi Gras, the guy just wanted, you know, four seconds of just the beat and didn't want the other 12 minutes of the record. So, um, you know, you're one of the most sample artists, I think. Um, on the top 10 sample artists, you were like right there, honorable mention at number 11. and 200 right. different times you've been sampled. And I think one of the biggest things, the most well-known, is um, Garden of Peace right. um, that Jay-Z used for, for uh, Dead Presidents. That was actually his first big hit record. Oh, good. Okay. And um, some more people use Garden of Peace as well, right? Oh, Jay, um, Mary J. Blige, because she won a Grammy that Take Me As I Am. Yes. I mean, the production was fantastic. Orchestra and everything. Mm -hmm. the video. Yes. And um, so, and it is, I think, because I remember you were talking, uh, just the sound of use expansions. Sure did, for talking all that jazz, right? Right, so I understand that, because expansions, you know, you got the beat and everything. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. But what blew my mind was a garden of pieces just... Very mellow. It's mellow, very mellow. And I said I had a grand piano, mm -hmm. then I overdubbed the Fender Rose electric piano. Uh -huh. And... You know, I said, well, shit, I'm going to do something spiritual. I mean, you know, because everyone needs a garden of peace with all this craziness going on. Certainly. And so, uh, so I sat down with it, and uh, what was it? What did I do? Uh, And what happened was, I heard all these 
rappers start adding all these beats. I mean, right. they're good at putting beats together. Yeah, yeah. So I heard them putting all these beats on, on God and the Peace and other songs. I said, wow, I got to do these songs over one day. Mm. I said, wait a minute. I said, wait a minute. Let me, let me see if I can put my cosmic sound on God and the Peace and come up with a thing. And I said, sure. well... That's truly amazing because, you know, when the rappers sample jazz, it's usually jazz from the, the 70s. Um, so it's ironic that that album, I think it was from 83. It was from Your Dreams of Tomorrow. Oh, it was the album okay, and right. the song was Garden of Peace. But um, a, a lot of the guys who are digging in the crates to, to sample these records, they're usually not going into the 80s. So whoever was the first one to find that, they... Um, they were doing, you know, they were doing a little, digging a little deeper because a record from '83 usually people weren't. Uh, oh, looking. okay. So that's um, oh, that's, that's good. That, that's pretty amazing. So you said that um, now you put a new reworking on it, which you just played. Um, so when you play it live now, um, are you kind of jazzing it up a little bit because right. of what the hip hop guys have done to it? That was it. I was, I, I played the first part just mm -hmm. like you know, and then you add those and, extras, yeah. Right, because I said the, the hip hop guys, I guess mm -hmm. you know it's. It's coming back around. Yes. Because I hear, I mean, they're good at coming up with these with these beats or rhythm tracks. Mm -hmm. I said, oh, so maybe I should do a lot of these songs over one day. Yeah. And because uh, they, they they can add a whole nother oh, thing to it when they, when they when they change the rhythm at the bottom. Mm -hmm. and, and it works. Yeah, certainly, certainly. Now I don't want to get too much into your personal business, but because <laughs> because you have been sampled uh, over two hundred times, it's probably well over two hundred. Um, do you own the rights to your music? Yeah, Jay, I was, I was really blessed because, um, you know, the, the average musician, you're so busy thinking about playing, you know, you, mm -hmm. you, you doing creativity and you're trying to figure out things and wow. Mm -hmm. I mean, because uh, just like most people don't realize, rock and roll is, is based on the blues. That's on the three chords, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. the one chord, an F, B flat, four chord. Back to the album, and back to the scene. So we all started that way, you know, mm -hmm. with Robert Johnson, all of them, uh, Led Belly. We uh -huh. listened to all mm -hmm. that stuff. and Okay. But, you know, you say, well, dang, I want to do something different. How can, how can I do something different? And you just keep going on until you do it. Mm -hmm. But um, I ended up with the publishing and the writers. That's, that's mm -hmm. an important thing. Yes. Uh, now, maybe that's because of Bob Theo, because he was a mm -hmm. producer, and I don't think he, he a lot of the companies took took the musicians' publishing, mm -hmm. but Bob Theo never never did that. So okay, so I was really blessed that way. Now I wish I'd have known about the masters, yeah. but we never know about the masters, mm -hmm. and because I think only one person and then ended up with masters. That was Ray Charles. Yes, and so. Uh, so do you know when they when someone sample your song they they call your representatives and mm -hmm. they work out a deal mm -hmm. or percentage. Yes. And so it did, and in the end it it works out for both parties. Certainly, certainly. So for 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 musicians of yesteryear who may not work as much today, I guess that could be some good supplemental income along with touring. Um, oh. You know, people sampling your stuff and you getting that. That's percentage. that's it, Jay. I, I mean, that really helps because. Um, I know some artists, man, I mean, had monster hits, 
but the, the, the record label owns, owns the publishing to, to that song. And mm -hmm. I said, wow. So when someone wants to sample one of your records and they go through whatever service they go through to get the clearance for the sample, do you usually uh, want to hear it, what they're going to do with your music first, or you just approve anything? What, how does it work? What, what happens, they always send you an um, MP3. Okay. So you, you listen to it. And, um, you know, a, a couple of them, <laughs> <laughs> or they, they, but, you know, you said, well, shoot, this, you know, the, but they, some of them are, are kind of strange, mm -hmm. but, but they're not, they're not going on the radio anyway. Right. So, you okay. know, that's just the way it goes. So it had never been anything so, so raunchy that you said, no, I don't want my music represented that way. No, actually. Somebody sent me one one time. I, it might have been Emin, or Eminem. Okay. And but he was using, I think a song by Dr. Lonnie. Ah. So, so they said. So they, I said no. I I can't. You can't. You know. You can't take credit for what, what you don't do. Ah, got and you. Probably karma anyway. Yes, sir. And so I, I listened to the song. Oh, Jay. I said no. I didn't write the song, but 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 Jay, the song was terrible. <laughs> I mean, you know, <laughs> lyric wise. Yeah, right. Oh, I, I I can imagine. I can imagine. So, you know, to be so heavily sampled, you know, with stuff that you made forty some years ago, how does that feel to be able to for it to reciprocate and do a three sixty and come back where you're actually inspired by what the rappers are doing with music you made forty years ago? How does that make you feel at this point? Um, to to be honored in that way. I mean, it feels great. I mean, because it's because I always wanted my music to be uh, eternal. Mm -hmm. You know, it's in because you got these one hit records or one hit wonders they call them, and yes, but because music to me is, is universal and it's supposed to be eternal. You sure. know, just like look, the sun, the moon, and stars have been here for a whole. I don't know. I guess you can't even count that much. Right. So I wanted to try to make the music that way. Certainly. And and it makes you feel good, but like I said, about a garden of peace. I talk to the young young kids, you know, 12, 13, 14, 15, 16 on up, and they say, "Oh man, garden of peace is so beautiful." Mm -hmm. And they say, "Cause I wanted people to listen to it, Certainly. and and get that feeling like you know, of peacefulness, and then yes. go into this garden." And so I I, I must have did it right. Certainly. So um. I'm a fan of uh, Pharrell Sanders, and I know that you play uh, with, with Pharrell Sanders, yeah. and I have a record um, from from him, Deaf, Dumb, and Blind. Yeah. And I saw on the cover, you know, several artists, and I saw you on the front with your kalimba, and I didn't, <laughs> I didn't know you played the kalimba. I'm a huge fan of Maurice White and Earth, oh, Wind, and Fire, yeah. and, uh, you know, he definitely mastered the kalimba, so you're, you're a kalimba player as well. Not like Maurice. <laughs> I mean, that brother, I mean, you have to give him credit. He took that kalimba, I mean, he really took it to a whole nother level. Okay. A, mu a musicology. Because I mean, I, I think, I think, I always kept it, you know, you know this. Mm -hmm. I forgot what key it is. And, um, mm -hmm. but, uh, oh, but Maurice can really, he's so musical with it. Mm -hmm. So I would just fit it in when I played it, you know, when Farrell, you know, you could make certain sounds. Certainly. And, uh, but that, that, that album cover is, people should try to keep it because, or get it because, Everyone on that album cover man, ended up with their own band and everything. Mm -hmm. uh, and so, just like when you know, when, when I when I first met Farrell, he was playing all these. Sound he was playing more than one note. I said, right. Farrell, how can you do that? Right. And then I said, you know, the horn player is supposed to be able to do that. And then I was trying to get more sound out of the piano, mm -hmm. so I'm doing. So I said, well, I, I got 10 fingers. I need more sounds. And I use my, you know, I use this thing and try to get more sound. Uh -huh. He said, well, Fer, and Fer, I said, yeah, well, I like what you do. You're getting more sound. Yes. He said, let's go hear this guy I heard people talking about. I said, okay. We went to hear Leon Thomas yes. singing. But then all of a sudden, he started yodeling. I said, wow. oh, my goodness. This <laughs> is this is different. So Bob Field called Farrell. I said, Farrell. We gonna do the first record, and he said, "Who who are you gonna use?" He said, "I gotta use Lonnie and Leon Thomas, and then we got a whole bunch of other musicians went in the studio and did Karma, and that took off." Okay. So. So Karma was the first thing you did with Pharrell. Right. right. Karma was the first one. The creator has a master plan. Yes. Yes. <laughs> Okay. 
Yeah. So now, on let us go into the house of Lord uh, off this Pharrell Sanders uh, album. It says on the credits, adapted by Lonnie Lister Smith. So what exactly did you do? Did you arrange that or? Yeah, just arranged it to fit, you know, what we were doing. Mm -hmm. um, you know, with Farrell and Leon and everyone. Because when a song is, oh man, that song probably been around for, I don't know, maybe a hundred years. Yes. And when a song gets so old, you can, uh, you can, you can adapt it. And, and yeah. do all kinds of arrangements with it. Mm -hmm. And then, plus, I think I heard, uh, oh, man, what was that group that did it? Uh, the Singers. Um, oh, yeah. Um, oh, man, they were fantastic. I know, uh, a few people have made it. I know what you're talking right. about. Right. Wow, wow. And so you took lessons. You don't play by ear or anything. You you classically trained. Uh, oh yeah, well you know, uh, we start taking lessons, mm -hmm. and then you go to. Uh, I had two great teachers at Morgan State University, Mrs. Hill, Mrs. Diggs, okay. and um, so oh yeah, but but you got to be able to, because I met people. I mean, you you go to Europe, met all these great classical pianists. Mm -hmm. And I was in the music store one day uh -huh. and just playing like that, you yeah. know. And they walked up. I mean, young people, these people were classical pianists, and they would say, uh, "Where's the music?" I said, "What music?" <laughs> uh, so I'm just playing. They said, "No." They they said, "Well, we can't play unless we have music." Uh -huh. the sheet, the actual sheet, sheet music. music. And I said, "Oh, well, no, I'm just playing." They said, "Well, how can you do that?" <laughs> so. I guess you know that just one of them gifts yes, uh, from the creator, and so um, so you you got you got to be able to you got to be able to do that if you're gonna create, because creating improvisation in the moment that's that's something else. Certainly. Now I noticed most of your recordings were on Flying Dutchman records. Is that correct? Right. And that was Bob Thiel, right? Yeah. Okay. And you said before he produced most of the Coltrane stuff. Oh man, well, some of Coltrane. Jay, he he did all the real Coltrane stuff, and you know that that, that everybody's familiar with. He produced Coltrane. He did the one with Duke Ellington and Coltrane. Mm -hmm. He did. Um, he goes all the way back to Buddy Holly, and and, and then when he had Fine Adjustment Records, he produced. Uh, he produced Farrell. He put Saunders, Gato Barbieri, mm -hmm. you know, uh, Gil Scott Hearn in yes, the beginning. That was, yes. that was Bob Thiel. Yes, right. He and so I did all the things I did. Then he had people like Stanley Clark and mm -hmm. Ayrton was was on That's doing right. things uh, on all the albums. Mm -hmm. So uh, Bob Bob was good. He never got in your way. He mm -hmm. would just let he he let you go in the studio and be an artist. Mm -hmm. You know, he didn't try to tell you what to do. Although he would come up with these old funny. Titles, mm -hmm. he said, Lonnie, why don't you do a song called Jumpy Mama? I said, No, no, Bob, that's not spiritual. <laughs> and, uh, but actually, man, he, he produced that famous record. I heard it this morning, uh, Louis Armstrong. What's that one about a world, wonderful world or something? Oh, yeah. Um, I think he has a wonderful world. He, wow, that was him? That was Bob. I did. I think Bob had something to do with the writing of it. Wow. So, wow, that's a, yeah, somebody gets heavy royalties off that. That record right. everywhere. 
And you said that Phil was a kind of a master of creating different uh, record labels because he also you were um, you did some stuff with Dr. Jazz and the logo for Dr. Jazz looks a lot like Flying Dutchman and that's Phil as well, right? Oh, my, <laughs> Jay, he was a master at uh, I mean he was he's definitely a, good, a businessman. Sure. He could start these labels and build them up, mm -hmm. and then you know like RCA I think bought uh, bought Flying Dutchman. Mm -hmm. So I mean, was, so he knew how to wheel and deal, and, mm -hmm. and these companies would buy these labels once he get them started. And uh, but like I said, he really loved the music, so that's that's he was great. Okay, now in the '90s, uh, early '90s, you did something on Itchy Bond, the guy down in Atlanta who ran Itchy Bond Records. Mm -hmm. um, tell me a little bit about that experience. Yeah, that was another hard learning experience, business wise. Um, I did some things with Itchy Bond and. It was, uh, I think we did Stars. This guy had a record label in Baltimore, Star Trek or something. Okay, yeah. So then I said, well, wait a minute. Let me become an entrepreneur. Because they always talk about musicians, you know, always asking somebody to do something. I said, mm -hmm. I'm going to start my own label. Yes. Love Land Records. So I did this record, Transformation, everything. And uh, so I gave it to Ichiban. And then I found the hard way Ichiban was in the midst of bankruptcy, folding, and all that kind of stuff. Wow. But he didn't tell me. And when, during the bankruptcy, I was a low man on the totem pole. Because, mm -hmm. you know, when you owe CBS Records and, and all those people, mm -hmm. shoot, little love land records don't count. <laughs> right, right, exactly. <laughs> so you just left that hole in the bag. So now you had an album called Love Land. So what was the, what's the significance of Love Land? Is there some, some kind of significance? I don't know. I just, I just, well, I think at the song Loveland, because uh, did Donald? I don't know if Donald sang that or not. Um, okay. So I, when I was trying to think of a record, you know, a name for a record, I said Loveland Records. Okay. Mm -hmm. So, uh, well, you know, every, everybody wants to go to Loveland and stay there, but that's mm. that's hard. Yes, <laughs> the way it is. All right. So as far as musically, you had uh, you had a lot of big names on that um, on that Itchy Bond album. And uh, one that really struck out, I'm a big fan of uh, Phyllis Hammond, a very talented woman. Jay, I mean, that young lady, people, people don't realize how talented she was. I mean, the last video she did was with, uh, we did a session. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and I, I don't know, I guess we just got along, so she, we were doing this video, mm -hmm. Jay, and she was singing. Then all of a sudden she said, wait a minute, this is Lonnie's uh, video. So she reached over. You can see it. She reached over at the end. She mm -hmm. said, "Come on, I, like, like." Oh, she, she, she wanted me to start singing, but it wasn't recorded. Right. Okay. So, but she said, "Yeah, you know, you got to get more of you in the video." So she started singing, but she was singing, and but she was singing in my ear, and I was singing, but of course I wasn't recorded. Right. But Jay, when she was singing in my ear, I said, "This girl can really sing." Yes, yeah, she can. I mean, I'm talking. People don't know what. There's a difference between really singing mm -hmm. and singing. Exactly. And pe people, people don't, most people don't know the difference. Yeah, certainly. She definitely, not only was she a beautiful woman, very talented. Oh, I was telling you before, yeah. I've seen her uh, like on um, live performance. I've seen her whistle. And she could whistle with more rhythm than a lot of people could sing. Very talented woman. Jay, that's, I mean, like, you know, like Sarah Vaughn could sing. Mm -hmm. I mean, could sing. Mm -hmm. Ella Fitzgerald could sing. I mean, Nancy Wilson, Phyllis Hyman could sing. Definitely, definitely. And you had, that's a power packed album. You had like Grover Washington Jr. on there, and you had Gene Carr, Najee, uh, you know, Norman Connors, big, big album, big, big names at least. I oh, mean, yeah. You, you said the business wasn't right, but you, at least you had the talent on there. Oh, you, you didn't yeah. want to cheat the people. As you no, said. no, I'm not, I'm not ever going to do that, man. You, I'm not going to cheat the people. I'm not going to disrespect people like Duke Ellington and Monk mm -hmm. and. Mm -hmm. Train and Miles. I mean, you you can't do that. Certainly, certainly. And so Plunky, um, Plunky's from here. You know, you used to go by oh, the name yeah. Plunky, and the one that's a Juju was the name of the group back when I was coming up. Um, and being that you're both Richmonders, you ever run into Plunky? Have any jam sessions or anything? Yeah, I think we did something when I first came back. Okay. I think maybe '88. I think. And, okay. Um, Thing was down. I thought they had them shows down there by the Coliseum yes. outdoors. Okay. And I think I, I used Plunkett on then. Mm -hmm. And but then I think Plunkett used way before he came back to Richmond, because I think he was out in California for a while. Yes. And I think he used to come and sit in when you know when Farrell we'd be out there doing shows. Okay. And um, but you know Plunkett, you know Plunkett, 
And I think he he was we used the same uh drummer, Shante. He was from Africa. He yes. came over with Hugh Masekela. Yes, yes. He had that African hat. Yes. And uh so um so Brown's been doing all right. I think he's he has his own record label. That's yes. good. Yes, yeah. Yeah. He's been he's been an entrepreneur for a while. He's running, that's, that's, that's running a good everything word. right over in the West End by the park. Still that's still it. doing it from over there. That's a good word. All right. Yeah, yeah. All right. So um Cosmic Echoes. I always when I was younger and I was going through my little spiritual journey, I always thought that was a really good name. In the nineties when we had a little another awakening, you know. I think it was Malcolm X said every every thirty years uh, black people get an awakening and we get oh, black okay. every thirty years. In the nineties when everybody was going back to their 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 pro black thing, I thought the Cosmic Echoes was a really good name. What uh how did you come up with the Cosmic Echoes? Did you come up with that name? Yeah, because what happened, I was you know, doing all kinds of research and in search of the truth and Certainly. I was reading that it said all everything that all the sounds we hear are a reflection of the cosmos. Yes. And I said, Ah, oh, okay, that's it. So I said, okay, the cosmic echoes. And that's what I did. And like you say, it, it worked. Every, everyone loved it. Yes. And so that was it. All right. Now, of all the places that you could have settled, you know, with all the traveling you've done, you know, overseas and as big as you are around the world, you, could, you probably could have settled anyway. What made you come back to little Richmond, Virginia to, uh, to settle down again? <laughs> well, yeah, that was it because New York has, has really changed. Yes. Um, I mean, at one time, New York really was a mecca. Mm -hmm. I mean, you had 52nd Street. Yes. I mean, it was, I mean, every, the greatest towns in the world were all in one block. Mm -hmm. You could just jump from club to club. Mm -hmm. And I caught the tail end of Birdland. Mm -hmm. And that's why I met uh, Sunrise Musicians, John yes. Gilmore. That's another ton of players people don't, people don't realize, yes. realize how great he was. Yes. And so, um, so once you get established, you can just fly anywhere. The, and most people are, are going back home now. Mm. Uh, so I can't, I said, well, I, said, I told my wife, I said, well, let's, let's go back to Richmond. You mm -hmm. know, let's start all over again. And okay. so when you have to go to Europe or anywhere, Japan, you just have to get on a plane. Mm -hmm. But now in New York, they can fly direct right. from anywhere in the world. But in Richmond, I got to go to Dallas and, yes. and all that. But, it, you know, it works. So you like it. Richmond's not too slow for you. It's just right pace for you uh, at this uh -huh. point for you. Yeah, because, um, oh, dude, be honest, I, I do love um, Baltimore and Harbor. Sure. You know, because it's, yes. it's closer to New York and all that. But, good food, too. Good seafood. Oh, well, <laughs> right. Well, you know. And, uh, but but Rich, Rich, Richmond is um, it's growing. Mm -hmm. I mean, man, it seems like people are coming from all different nationalities. They're coming from everywhere. Yes. coming to Richmond. So yes. it's just it's interesting to watch it grow. Sure. Yeah. Certainly. Well, it's been an honor. Definitely been the highest honor to talk to you. Uh, Jay, I enjoyed it. Shoot. Yes, and I definitely appreciate all the knowledge. Definitely. All right. Thank you, brother. Thank you. All right.